So we're moving on to radical functions. And these are functions with any sort of root of x. But for now, we're just going to deal with square roots. So if we consider the function y or f of x equals the square root of x, we have a graph that looks something like this. And we can see right from it um, that the domain is just all positive real numbers. So we're just going to write x such that x is greater than or equal to 0. Right, because we know we can't take the square root of a negative number. And based on the graph, we actually see the same is true of the range, right? We see that the function takes on all positive real numbers as its range. There are no asymptotes. The graph just kind of stops right here. Right? The graph just kind of stops there. It's not approaching it. It doesn't cross it. It just kind of ends. So there are no asymptotes. So IB is really big on the thought process of problems. That's one thing that makes it um, A, challenging, but B, also a lot of fun to teach. And because of that, normally I would just kind of tell you how this is going to work, but we're going to walk through it instead. We'll come up with generalizations later on um, in this unit. But for now, if I want to find the domain and range of this function here, 2 minus the square root of 2x plus 3, the first thing I want to do is actually just tell you about a little bit of notation. And these three, dot, these three dots that are forming kind of a triangle just means therefore, whoops. And IB likes to use the word hence instead of therefore. So if you ever see me use those three dots, that's what it means. So the domain is easy enough. Maybe I'll use a different color here. All right, the domain is easy enough because I know whatever is under the square root has to be positive. I cannot have, or zero, I cannot have anything negative underneath my square root. So if I just solve this inequality, I have x greater than or equal to negative 3 over 2. Right. So my domain would be all real numbers x, such that x is greater than or equal to negative 3 over 2. And of course, you could write this as an interval if you wanted to as well. Either way is fine. And this is actually where maybe I could use my therefore dots, right? So for range, range is going to be a little bit tricky, but we're going to start in very much the same way, right? I'm going to start with whatever my function is, the square root pieces anyway. I'm going to start with the square root pieces because we know that the range is going to be such that the square root of x is always going to be positive. That's kind of what this means here. So we're going to start with just that square root piece. I know that this whole chunk of my function has to be positive. I could never make that equal a negative number. Our job, our goal, is to transform this piece into the entire function. So I'm going to keep adding things or multiplying things as needed until I get to my function. And we're going to do it one piece at a time. So if I look at my um, existing piece now versus my entire function, I notice two different things. I notice that my square root, let me do this in another different color. I notice that my square root is actually being subtracted. So I have to figure out a way to tack that on. Um, actually, you know what? Maybe I'll highlight instead. And I also notice that I have this 2 here as well. So I'm going to have to find a way to add both of those into the work I've already done. And that's not too bad, right? The first thing I'm going to do is make my square root negative. So I'm going to multiply by negative 1. And of course, whatever I do on one side, I have to do to the other. And with an inequality, whenever I multiply by negative 1, I need to change the direction of my inequality. So there you go. Taken care of. Done. The next thing I need to do is add 2. So I need to introduce this 2 here. And I'm going to do that by adding 2 to both sides. So I'm going to do that to my right hand side as well. Right, Whatever I do to one hand side, I have to do to the other. And then I notice that I've already got my function. Right, This is my function as it already appears up here. So we're good, right? We're actually going to make a substitution just to make it a little bit easier to look at and 
since I know that this is my function and I've said y is equal to that function, I'm just going to say that y is less than or equal to 2. Therefore, my range of the function is all y such that y is less than or equal to 2. We're going to talk more about why this is when we get to the end of the chapter. Um, in 2.5, we'll talk about transformations in, um, in more generality. But for now, this is kind of way, the way to do it. Take it piece by piece, um, starting just with that entire square root until you've made it to whatever your function is supposed to be. It's just kind of how it is. IB doesn't spend a lot of time on this, so neither will I, so we're just going to move on. We're going to move on to piecewise functions, which IB spends even less time on because it's really simple. All you got to do is take it piece by piece. You don't have to do anything fancy at all. These are maybe a little overwhelming looking because there are two parts to them, but they're really straightforward to graph. If I notice here, I've got two pieces to my function, two conditions. I've got this 2x minus 1, and that's going to happen whenever x is less than 1. And I've got this x squared, which is going to happen whenever x is greater than or equal to 1. So if I'm going to graph this, we're just going to graph both pieces. Actually, the first thing I'm going to do when I do piecewise functions, I like to mark in where the condition changes. So I'm just going to draw a horizontal, like a vertical dotted line for now. It kind of looks like an asymptote. It's not. Um, just so I know where I need to break off my function. Because the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm actually going to graph the entire function and then just cut off the part that I don't need. So if I start with this 2x minus 1, well, I know my y-intercept is negative 1. It's got a slope of 2. So I'm just going to go ahead and draw that in. Perfect. And then I'm going to erase the part that I don't need. Right? I only want the parts less than 1. So I'm going to cut away, I'm going to erase the part that is greater than 1, because I don't need that. So there's my one piece done. I'm going to do this to the other side, the other case as well. x squared when x is greater than or equal to 1. So I'm just going to take what I know about x squared. I know 0, 1, 2 would go to 4. So I'm just going to go ahead and just kind of sketch this. Same thing on the other side. So I have my whole function. And I don't want anything that is less than 1. So I'm going to erase just those pieces. And there's my function. And actually, I kind of picked one that matches up. right? Both pieces um, match here. If I were to pick something that were not to line up, right? you see that and what I mean by this matching up is you see that both of these functions share the point 1, 1. And as a result, my piecewise function is actually continuous. Right? I can draw it without picking up my pencil. But if I were to maybe change this function, just to kind of prove a point here, maybe I change this to minus 3. So if I were to... Oh, let's see if I can do this. If I kind of take this piece and just slide it down. Yeah, there we go. Right, we see that my function is no longer continuous. So I would need to do one thing. If you think about, if you remember with inequalities on a number line, right, we had these like open circles and closed circles for whether we are including or not that point. We're going to use these here. And because my first case is strictly less than, then I know that I'm not including 1 there, right? 1, if I'm evaluating x equal to 1, I'm going to use my second case because x is greater than or equal to 1. So then my function, my blue piece, is going to get an open circle at 1. And I guess that's not really exactly accurate, but it's close enough for now. Um, because I'm not including x equal to 1 here. I'm including x equal to 1 here, so it gets a close, whoops, it gets a closed circle because I want to use it here. 
right? X equals one would fall under the second case. And so it gets a closed circle there. Um, it's possible to do this with your graphing calculator. We will do this in class later.